Good evening, my name is Jacob Powell, General Agricultural Extension Agent for Sherman and Wasco Counties with Oregon State University Extension Service. This evening I'm joined by federal and state fire managers who are willing to have a discussion with us regarding wildfire preparedness and how best uh, ag producers and landowners can engage with first responders when they arrive on scene to a wildfire incident. So I'd like to thank Bart Kicklider Fire Management Officer for the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area for joining us tonight. We also have Scott McDonald, Assistant Fire Management Officer for the Barlow Ranger District with the Forest Service joining us. We have Kyle Narns with Oregon Department of Forestry based out of the Dallas, Oregon as their Assistant Unit Forester. And also we have Don Deshida with Bureau of Land Management from Grass Valley and Madras area serving there as the Assistant Fire Management Officer. So thank you very much for joining. Let's get started. This um, chart here is kind of from the National Wildland Cohesive Strategy. And so, I mean, it's kind of breaking up this presentation into three different um, sections. Uh, gonna first focus in on, um, on how we can be a better fire adapted community, kind of focusing on the community preparedness side of that. And then going in a counterclockwise direction and then focusing on resilient landscapes in terms of what things we can do on the ground that would make these uh, rural communities more resilient to fires that occur in the future. And then concluding with uh, how we can have a more safe and effective wildfire response. And uh, throughout all this, hopefully have some good uh, Q&A with some of the other uh, federal and state stakeholders that have been able to call in here this evening as well. So to begin with, this is a newer, um, wildfire risk assessment that they've come out with that USDA and the Forest Service did. And basically they're ranking different uh, states, counties and communities uh, across the entire United States. And so what you can see here, we have the bubble chart here. And basically, you know, the, the larger the bubble, the bigger the population. And then similarly, the darker the red, the more chances of a, a wildfire occurring there. And so Oregon ranked across all the states in the United States, ended up being about 64% um, greater than average chance of having a likelihood. So again, this is just focusing on what's the chance in a certain given area that a wildfire will occur. And I also share in the chat box with you guys several links I'll be referring to tonight. And that first one there uh, should be the wildfirerisk.org link. Um, feel free to click on that and take a look at that during this presentation. And I uh, also have another poll to launch here. Here we go. And I kind of forgot, but the earlier poll that I did also had for Wasco County. Now this is asking about Sherman County and the region of Shanico as well. What you what your personal opinion is that you think the risk assessment would, would show for some of those communities. And I have to say, when I first saw the results from this uh, assessment, I was a little surprised how high some of these areas were. You might okay. have to refresh me on where these two counties are. <laughs> Sherman and, uh, I don't, I've never even heard of the other one, sorry. Oh yeah, no worries, just a sec. The next slide will kind of help clarify that. Um, but anyway, so yeah, most people are kind of ranking these, um, ranking at these at kind of the higher, you know, 80 to 100 percentile. So Wasco County, I, here's a map of Wasco County for the caller that was a little confused there, but basically Wasco and Sherman County are in, in uh, North Central Oregon. Uh, just the south of Columbia River. And so this wildfire risk assessment, they then looked at Wasco County compared to all the other counties in the state. And Wasco County was basically in the 91st percentile in terms of having wildfire likelihood. And you can see they also did a map here that, you know, basically the darker the red there, the increased likelihood there is that there's going to be a wildfire occurring at that location. So you can see that in some of these communities, the further north that you go in some of these communities, there's a slightly decreased likelihood, uh, but still a pretty high likelihood across the county. And then Sherman County was ranked pretty closely to Wasco County. 
and it was in the 97th percentile. I don't know if you can see this on the bubble chart here, but there's basically two other bubbles right around Truman County, and that's Gillum and Wheeler County. And so Gillum and Wheeler County were at like the 98th and uh, 100th percentile. And so definitely the eastern end of the mid-Columbia region, we have a really strong likelihood of fire occurring. This wildfire risk assessment, they also were able to do individual communities. And so Wasco County, uh, basically Womack and Pine Grove, they're in the uh, southern part of Wasco County, were ranked in the 100th percentile, so pretty high fire likelihood. And then I had also asked about Chanico, and um, Chanico is also ranked pretty high at the 90, 99th percentile in terms of wildfire likelihood. And so here you can see this assessment, all those little dots in this bubble chart here are basically different communities across the state. And so uh, Chanico is ranked pretty high up there in terms of wildfire likelihood. So it's also important when you think about uh, communities with uh, wildfire occurring that the risk is composed of several different factors that, you know, what is the likelihood at any given moment that a fire uh, could occur at that location, uh, given previous fire behavior and ignition sources and whatnot. And then also what's the intensity going to be when that fire occurs? So what type of fuels are there? What are the weather, what's the weather pattern going to be like when the fire is occurring that uh, a lot of the windy weather that we have around here, suddenly that drives that intensity factor up quite a bit because we can have uh, weather that is very conducive to a large building fire at times of the year. And then with risk, there's also vulnerability. And that is, you know, what's the degree that there's going to be exposure to the wildfire directly on in that community? You know, is the fire happening outside of town or is there the chance it's going to come direct contact with the buildings or have enough of an ember storm from those surrounding lands that are on fire that's going to expose that fire that community to the fire and also susceptibility uh how much of an impact is a wildfire going to have on that community's well-being and economics as well and so this website, this tool that they came out with, they also determined the risk to homes. And so like I was just trying to show there, you have the likelihood that we already discussed of a fire happening in Wasco County. And then you have that plotted against the consequences of that fire, given the intensity that will occur at and how that's gonna impact the local community. And so Wasco and Sherman counties respectively had a greater risk than 91% and 94% of counties in Oregon. And so this is definitely a, in an area that there can be big consequences for the wildfires and obviously they've done this after two big incidents with the eagle creek and the substation fire that that we know uh, how wildfires really can impact us here in the local counties and with fires some people get complacent that they think you know oh well this is never going to burn but basically as long as the planet's been around if you have something that has a carbon component it's possible that that will have some combustion that will occur. And so these pictures here are basically before and after the fire that happened on the Lolo National Forest. I worked with a instructor at the University of Montana Fire Management course as his teaching assistant that he's done a lot of fire work over Montana as a smoke jumper and several other uh, careers that he's had over there with fire. And so he took this photo and like he, he always uses this as an example that students or even his own mother would would uh, be skeptical sometimes, like, yeah, you know, a lot of this forest, it, look like, it looks like they're never gonna burn. But if you have that carbon source there and the potential for them to dry out, it will be consumed. And then you also have the fire behavior triangle where you have uh, fuel, topography, and weather that all interact with one another. And so in a way we have kind of some top-down controls that we really can't do anything about, and that's dictated by what the weather and climate does. And then we also have bottom up control on the ground and where that fuel is located in terms of the topography and terrain at that location. And so the only thing we can really change to be more defensible with wildfires, we can change that, uh, the fuel that's at that location. So change the fuel and then also we can decide where in the landscape we manipulate that fuel type to either uh, improve the chance, chances of us stopping a wildfire there uh, and potentially mitigating uh, fire from happening there in the future. 
So one big takeaway, especially talking about agriculture, it's just reminding people that's really important you think about where you park your equipment at the end of the day. And so here you can see this is actually a, a grape harvester unit that this machine, it's got tracks that fits in between a, a row of grapes and actually harvest it with a, a mechanized system. It's in Wasco County, uh, a gentleman was using this, parked at the end of the day and went home. And then the next day we saw this massive black cloud in Wasco County and people were really like, what, what is burning up there? And so luckily, you know, he parked in a good spot that it wasn't in tall grass or anything else. Uh, but especially with a lot of the wheat producers, that if you're not smart about where you leave your equipment at the end of the day, you can easily start a, a bad wildfire. And, uh, and so most producers are pretty good about, they realize that you think nothing's going to happen, but sometimes you leave and there's that drip of oil that's leaking on the hot part of the equipment that you didn't know about until a, a spark happens. And then when that happens late at night, you're long gone from the field where it's at. I'm also trying to encourage uh, producers and people, anybody with equipment being operated out there, think about ways that we can uh, decrease the chance of a, a fire happening out there. So a combine fire, combine fires are pretty common in the uh, engine compartment and also with the exhaust system. So often the issue there is that you have chaff or other harvesting debris that come up and come into close contact with hot components on the combine and that can ignite and start a fire. And so one solution, this is hard to see this picture, but basically this farmer down in Australia has wrapped chicken wire around this uh, turbocharger component and exhaust system. So basically he wrapped this chicken wire around it. So some of that larger debris, instead of hitting that in combusting, it just bounces off the screen and doesn't come into contact with those hot components. And likewise, having a fan there helps blow this stuff away so nothing hot is sticking to it. And likewise, this is a the screening thing here is something I like to use as an analogy too for homeowners that often you see people have um, wooden, um, wooden material that they use to basically shield their deck from uh, animals, basically protect their crawl space from random things going in and out, keeping their kids out of there, keeping wildlife out. And so one problem from a wildfire standpoint is having these made out of wood can be a, a hazard in Eastern Oregon where it's pretty dry. And the other thing is you still leave pretty large holes that the majority of homes that are lost to wildfires. It's not from the direct flames against the house. Often it's from embers flying up underneath the deck, flying in the eaves of the house. And that starts the, the house on fire on the inside basically. And so I really suggest to people that you think about using a one eighth inch uh, metal screening that you use across your eaves and under your deck and stuff like that. So it prevents embers from flying in there during a wild, wildfire event. So another thing we can do with we're trying to be defensible about wildfires, thinking about, well, when are we out there? Maybe there's times of the day or times with weather patterns, it's best that we just stay out of the field rather than risk something happening. And so we have our red flag warnings that happen and that's typically when you have low RH below 15%, uh, you have frequent wind gusts greater than 25 miles per hour. And this is often can be accompanied by a thunderstorm or sometimes we just have a thunderstorm warning and that can dictate a red flag warning that goes into effect. Um, so something I've been telling producers about that there's a, a new requirement that they think about if they have if they need to meet OSHA requirements, they need to think about having shut down shut down criteria that they decide not to go out in the field to harvest. And so just real briefly, I just want to show this that a lot of the new OSHA stuff is kind of following what they've already done down in Australia. And so there they have this grassland fire danger index. And basically they set a voluntary criteria with their producers down there. And so they have this code of practice that they decide once the grassland fire danger index gets to a certain uh, index number, that then the producer agrees to not go out in the field and be harvesting. They can do, still do mechanical work on equipment, um, but they really shouldn't be out in the dry field actively harvesting their combine because there's a good chance if they have an accident and a spark starts something, they're not going to be able to get a handle on that before it gets out of control. And so that the Australia, the GFDI, they set that minimum at 35. 
And so what that 35 means, is you can see that 35 is right between the 20 and 40 fire danger index here. And so basically at that point, if you try to do a direct attack on that fire, it's, um, it's likely that's not gonna put the fire out. That if you're just at danger index of 20, there's a good chance you will be able to take, put that fire out with a direct head attack on the frontal uh, flame front that the wind is pushing. But once you get into 35 or 40, there's a really good chance that uh, doing a, a head attack is not going to put the fire out. And if you did try to do that, there's a good chance um, somebody would get hurt. And so I took some of the information from Australia and created this chart that basically down there, what they do is they have a temperature minimum. Um, well, they take the temperature reading for the day. So let's say it's 77 degrees third column down here on the red for temperature. And then they have a relative humidity of 25%. And then they line up those two columns and the number that you get is the average wind speed that you should, that you could still be harvesting in. So basically if it's 77 degrees out, 25% RH, you could be out there harvesting your grain as long as the wind speed was at 24 miles per hour or lower. Once it exceeds 24, then you have to, to think about not doing it. And so I've shared this with some producers because some uh, agricultural folks, it's really hard not to want to be harvesting on a, a red flag day at times when the wheat is actually dry enough that they can actually be harvesting it that day. Um, so I'm trying to trying to have this as a new new concept and way to think about how we can ensure that we're not out there harvesting on a day that if we did have an extent, there's a good chance it would get away from us. Uh, another thing in talking about preparedness is a lot of folks don't necessarily have a farm map or emergency uh, plan in place. And so when first responders do show up on scene, sometimes they have no idea where things are located on the property. And so basically coming up with a map that the producer can actually document where some of the hazards are on their farm, such as maybe they have an anhydrous tank that they sell some stuff left in where are their propane tanks at? And then similarly, trying to have a conversation of where can we put those maps so that a first responder could easily access those. And so I think it was in Iowa that this picture's from, but they had a grant program that they were actually helping producers make these maps. And then they were having people basically create these PVC tubes that then they would put on a fence post or somewhere close to an entry point that a first responder would be going through to access to their farm and that way that first responder could, could see the map. And so I don't, I don't know right now if any of the other stakeholders on the call, if you guys have any uh, tips or suggestions, or I mean, have you really come across many producers that actually had an emergency map that you could take a look at, or you kind of have to figure that out once you arrive on scene? Most far as from ODF, uh, you know, on the wildfire response, um, you know, I wouldn't say a property map as as necessary, but just really somebody to tie in with to give us an idea of the lay of the land and kind of general access points. You know, more of the structure folks, I think, would benefit from some of that other mapping and planning yeah. stuff yeah. if they were involved. Yeah. So another another thing to think about with emergency preparedness and uh, and yeah, I mean, I I can echo that that. Um, when there's a fire happening, stuff is happening so quickly, they don't necessarily have time to go find a map and look at it. You kind of need to know on the fly what's going on. Um, and I'm also trying to share with folks that we think about how we cover livestock and emergency action plan. And um, just real quick here, I can also show basically I have the uh, emergency action plan template that I can share here. If I can uh, share it through the chat here, just a sec here. But in general, as I find this, basically I'm trying to have people think of more about um, livestock preparedness. Um, 
because often the fire happens and the question is, well, where are your animals at? Um, are they in the way? And then uh, often the landowner is so busy trying to deal with the fire, they, they don't necessarily have time to try to move them. So, okay, now I have this uh, emergency action plan loading that I'm referring to in some of these spots so you guys can take a look at. And so to try to encourage people to basically come up with a plan before the fire happens, talk to your neighbors that maybe aren't gonna be engaged with trying to put the fire out. And you know, hopefully you're talking to neighbors, they have a stock trailer and a place that they could potentially go take your animal to. I know when the, the substation fire happened, uh, there were some great um, good Samaritans that basically showed up with stock trailers and helped some people out and basically got their animals out of there. But in the future, maybe trying to have a more uh, coordinated effort might relieve the stress on both the Good Samaritans that are trying to help folks out with that, and also the people who actually own the livestock as well. Um, and something I try to encourage people is a last ditch effort. If anything else, maybe think about which gates you should leave open so that your animals can at least get out of the way of the fire uh, if there's no other escape route for them to get out. And so thinking more about what we can do in the landscape in terms of fire preparedness, a lot of things have changed with uh, dryland agriculture, especially in Wasco and Sherman County. And so the biggest thing is just we've gone from uh, heavy tillage, especially on the fallow fields to no-till agriculture that's suddenly we're leaving residue on the field year round. So it used to be that you had a checkerboard of places that were in crop and out of crop and those areas that were out of crop and tilled were a good chance that if the fire got through the wheat field, at least it would hit that fallow field and go out. But now we don't have that benefit uh, any longer. And no-till has been great for soil and water erosion control, uh, but it is, it is good to think about that there are some other uh, costs associated with this that maybe we hadn't thought about initially. And the other thing that we learned in like the substation is just sheer um, continuity is mind boggling when you look at a map. Um, this is just basically showing all the fields in light brown to dark brown, basically showing fields that are being in wheat production. And so it used to be, you know, half of these would just be bare dirt that fire would go out on. Now we've got fuel basically across this entire region. Map here is basically from this program called Rangeland Analysis Platform or RAP. Uh, that's in one of the links that I sent in the chat. And so basically this uses satellite imagery data that they're able to kind of calculate basically uh, annual forb and grass cover, perennial grass cover, uh, shrub cover, tree cover. So they've done a lot of stuff with this RIP program for the sagegrass initiative where they're concerned about needing enough um, sagebrush cover for sage grouse and trying to deal with conifer encroachment that they've shown to be a detriment uh, to sage grouse, grouse populations. And so this map here is showing in red the annual forebrand grass cover percent for 2019. And so you can see the Dallas here going across uh, Wasco and Sherman County. And so you can see the areas in white are all those areas that are in crop. So obviously a large proportion of the landscape. So to bounce back to what I just said, you know, we've got this big fuel continuity issue with the wheat side. And we also have a lot of uh, annual grasses that basically are in those areas that are not under wheat. So those are just as, as flammable, if not more. And so another thing you can do with this range line analysis platform that I want to point out is that you can also look back at uh, burn scars of where previous fires have happened. And so, I mean, I've, I've played with this quite a bit and basically what you quickly see is that, you know, across years, basically the majority of the fires are happening is as most of us know, they're occurring on basically the breaks of either the chutes or along the John Day River. And so those are areas that we have uh, interesting weather patterns with winds up, up and down those canyons. We have a lot of fuel there. We have uh, lanes that are managed by different jurisdictions. We have a lot of Oregon State Parks land there. And so that can be a tricky spot to manage. And so I've been 
talking a little bit more about the north end of Sherman Wasco County. But these next couple images here are from south end of the county. So you can see basically right in the middle of this is Shanico. And so you can see we've got some of the um, some of the lighter red, but also some of the darker red colors here indicating increased annual grass coverage. And then in the red polygons here, these are the, the fires that happened in 2008. And so if we go through a trajectory of several years, I can go then to 2009, you can see how annual grass cover hasn't changed that much. You can see that we had a couple, two additional fires there. And then 2010, it gets interesting. You can see around uh, Antelope and Clarno, there's a lot of dark, dark areas there, dark red indicating very high annual grass coverage. So it's interesting that then that next year, 2011, you have a lot of fires that occurred by Clarno right in those areas that there was high annual grass coverage the year before. So there's abundant fuel there that, that likely uh, allowed those fires to escape and grow faster. Obviously there's several other factors that could have led to those fires developing as well, but it's just interesting that the annual grass cover kind of follows that a little bit. Then 2012, a couple more fires. You can see the annual grass coverage uh, fluctuates a little bit here, especially if you look 2013 to 2014, huge jump in the red there. And again, just seeing where those different fires have happened. Uh, interesting, 2017, uh, a lot of dark red, and then we had several fires that happened during 2017. And then the, the um, RAP program, they've only shown fire scars through 2017. So 2018 here, no fire scars showing up because they haven't done that yet, but you can see there's a lot of dark red in 2018. And that uh, kind of also followed the bad fires that we had with the substation fire that we definitely had a good annual grass crop that year for burning. And then uh, last year, 2019, fairly quiet fire season. Uh, you can see here there's not as much dark red on the map, so there's less annual grass coverage to burn. And so part of this is leaning into me kind of basically just trying to summarize what this coming fire season is going to look like for us here in Sherman and Wasco County. And so one, we're definitely moving into a drought, and it's anticipated that over the next couple months that that drought will just persist, if not increase to some degree. And so the, this is image here is from the uh, precept program. Basically the bottom line is percent of average precipitation. You can see where we're at here, basically we're down to the, um, well, even the 20 to 30% average precip in a few spots, the majority, you know, is we're slightly below 50% precip basically. So that means that yes, fields are extremely dry out there. Uh, it also means, however, that this last spring, we maybe didn't have as much uh, annual forage that was produced, so we might have less fields on the landscape, which could help. And so there's definitely a strong connection that, you know, in the early springtime, when we have a really uh, good spring precept year, stuff really greens it up, it looks beautiful. But then next, you know, it's July and August, and it's all uh, dirt brown and extremely dry. So in a way, that's one blessing that we're moving into a drought, but we have less fuels on the landscape and several spots to deal with. So one other program here, this is called uh, fuelcast.net. And this is a similar program to the RAP that uses satellite imagery to kind of give an estimate of biomass production. And so this here, it's a biomass production that's deviating from the last 15 year average. And so, Basically, areas that are green, that's basically normal, about normal biomass production. And then areas that are lightly brown are below, and then the areas that are blue or green are above. And so you can see the majority of this area around Chanico, we're primarily looking at about a normal biomass season. Uh, and in some cases, maybe perhaps a little bit below due to the decreased precipitation. And uh, similarly, if we look at an area like Grass Valley in Sherman County, um, in my opinion, it appears that there's maybe a little bit less areas that are below, maybe a more higher proportion of the landscape is at normal to slightly above normal, perhaps. But basically, th this, you know, showing that, you know, in terms of biomass on the landscape, we're looking at about average um, to, slightly, to slightly below. So that will help with some uh, fire issues. However, you know, obviously we have ignition sources that come from several areas. 
uh, you can have extreme weather events that could make, uh, you know, even a little bit of pr production on the landscape uh, burn fairly aggressively. So I uh, take consideration. And then thinking about what type of, of what type of plants are on the landscape, we also have different uh, types of landscaping plants that can uh, increase and protect areas from fire. Then we also have some dangerous plants here as well that are really big no-nos that uh, in Sherman Owasco County could really increase the rate of spread of a fire. Uh, could definitely send a lot of hot embers into a house if they're planted nearby that. And so basically, in terms of good landscaping plants, is you're looking for plants that have a higher percentage of fuel content moisture. So a lot of these are forbs that stay greener later in the season. Uh, intermediate wheatgrass is a good one that it uh, doesn't get too decadent as a grass. It has some good surface area on the bottom so that the fire doesn't go through it as quickly. And then dangerous plants, especially juniper or bad uh, scotch broom. This picture here, I used to do some prescribed burning in the Puget Sound up by Olympia. Uh, the, the scotch broom up there, it's, it's really eye-opening that that fuel looks really green and you wouldn't think it would burn that hot, but it has such high volatile oils in it that it can really uh, explode once it, it's ignited. Uh, and there's definitely areas in Wasco County that I see a lot of that scotch broom that um, right up next to people's homes sometimes. That's one of those that I think a lot of people don't realize just how dangerous it is. So I'm trying to educate people on that. Uh, then this is a good saying, uh, basically you want your defensible space around your property to be lean, clean, and green. That's kind of a good way to remember that. Uh, similarly, thinking about wildfire preparedness, uh, some of these big sagebrush plants can be somewhat volatile, can really burn hot. So I'm trying to encourage people to think about areas. This is actually the old homestead that uh, was burned up along the, the Chutes River in the substation fire. But you can see, I mean, all this tall sagebrush is right along the fence line. So it's in an area that's hard for a producer to go in and control. But it's something, you know, the fence is in the way, but it's still worth thinking about using Roundup or spending a lot of time to actually clear some of those fence lines of those debris that could really be a, be a problem in a fire that could cause a slop over, potentially throw up a lot of spots from some of these fields along some of those borders. And it was interesting in that substation fire, I think a lot of us know one thing to watch out for is when we have uh, fuel components that we have a bunch of that tall ryegrass mixed right in with the sagebrush. And so I, I do have a, one other poll here. If I can find the right one. So a lot of us kind of already know the answer to this question, but I'll throw it up there anyways. So I'm talking about ROM, but you know, some other fuels are also hazardous and difficult to control. And so again, we've got a small crowd here tonight, but basically the idea here is that uh, cheatgrass is definitely harder to control than sagebrush and ryegrass. But I've also heard that in some areas, there actually is enough precipitation that we have air issues with uh, lichen and moss. Um, for example, along I-84 by Celilo, a lot of those cliff faces, uh, when some of that lichen on that cliff, when they get on fire, it's extremely hard for the firefighters to get up close and, and put it out and then basically have it uh, starting to be consumed and it just lifts right off the wall and gets flung in the wind. And so then you have all these embers in spots that are being produced by that um, silly lichen and moss that's up on the wall. So that's an interesting field type that can be difficult and cause some issues on the fire line. So one thing that I wanted to try to, to talk about with uh, various stakeholders and we don't have as many people on the call as I'd hoped, uh, but basically the Forest Service and some others are coming up with these uh, pods, they call them potential operational delineations. So basically, you know, you think about the landscape, this is the Chutes River Canyon, you know, think about the landscape here and where are some critical uh, control points so we could maybe uh, identify ahead of the fire coming in. For example, putting like fuel breaks um, back a couple hundred feet from the edges of these canyons would maybe help stop the fire. And so again, here is a list of some of those other potential mapping and inventory things that you, we can help to think about. Um, so I don't know if any of the um, 
any of you agency folks have any experience uh, working with those on state or federal lands? Can kind of open it up to you guys from here real briefly. Yeah, this is Bart. Uh, I've had one of my captains working on pods for the uh, scenic area. Uh, we've kind of got a rough draft going. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. My battalion chiefs are reviewing them right now, but it's, um, yeah, it's something we're looking at, at, at having available anyway. Whether or not it's a useful tool, we'll find out in the future. But yeah, uh, yeah, there's there's definitely an interest in it from uh, um, several agencies in Oregon. Yeah, this is Scott McDonald. We've, we're in the process with our fire planner on the Mount Hood uh, going through the pods process, PCLs, and all that stuff. It's, uh, I believe it's in its analysis state at this point with uh, the thing is that Chris Dunn is doing the work on it for us. Okay. Yeah, he's kind of been the main one that has developed the, the pod system. Um, so I know it's something to work on with uh, in Wasco County that um, Gillum County is doing a really good job with kind of um, the county is kind of funding it, but there's various partners with NRCS, OSU Extension Service. They're all working on not necessarily doing the pod system, but basically you know, inventorying fire resources and then mapping those so that they can be accessible to, to both federal agency folks and also to landowners out there that are, are doing a lot of the firefighting on the landscape there. Um, I know Del Rey is on this call. I don't know if she has any anything else to say. She has worked in Gillum County. I wasn't really involved in that, Jacob. That was after I left. Okay. Thank you for your response. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, so uh, Jordan Maley with OSU Extension is doing a lot of the work over there. And so I'm hoping to partner with him to try to get Wasco and Sherman counties to think about doing some similar uh, inventory could pay, pay real dividends when we have an incident. So obviously, anywhere we go, I'm trying to share with producers, make sure that you kind of try to keep things cleaned up around the farmstead that often you, you park your old equipment and stuff. And it's so important that we keep those areas clear of flammable degrees debris especially for uh, firefighters when they show up I mean it's nice when they can actually see where the hazards are versus having a big field of drive through that you don't know if there's uh, hidden objects out there or not and so keeping some of those areas uh, neat really helps and another thing that's kind of been changing on the landscape has been with some some good NRCS and federal programs with USDA and the Farm Service Agency, for example, with the CREP program, uh, basically with uh, CREP, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, it's similar to the CRP program, but folks are really focusing on the riparian areas. And so in areas that we have good establishments and it stays green, it's doing a lot of great things for wildlife habitat. But it is one thing I just am sharing with folks to think about is that some of these crep areas there's not necessarily a lot of water that runs through those in the eastern part of the county and so we can have a big abund a big increase of fuel loading in those areas that could be real problematic when we have a fire so i think it's great that people stay in these programs but they need to think about having basically a buffer outside of those that they try to maintain either through grazing or uh, you know mowing mowing it um, and in this CREP program, they have, have buffer zones that you stay out of. So right outside of those buffer zones, we could do some fuel management work, I think, that, that might help in the future. And then grazing definitely has some good, good ways of decreasing fuel load on the landscape and helping us control fires. Um, so it's kind of a joke that fences stop fires, but really we know it's the grazing activity that occurs that really helps, helps put those out. Um, so decreasing the fuel load. And then another thing with fences too is it can also be problematic is that especially given that the, we've got a big tumble mustard crop from last year that's still on the ground in liars in Wasco and Sherman counties. And so those tumble mustards and other flammable debris, you know, they can get flung through the air and often they get hung up along these fence lines. So that can be difficult. Um, and then the other thing with fences too is sometimes they can make it difficult for the firefighters to get access when they come in there. Um, 
I don't know if any of the agency folks, do you guys have any tips on how people can make fences more friendly for you guys? Or I mean, in general, it's often if you guys have bolt cutters and you're not afraid to use them if you have to is kind of my understanding. Yeah, nothing too specific on that. I mean, it's kind of a necessary thing across the, the whole state. So um, no, nothing yeah. we really suggest too much. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, wire cutters, and then we just note where, where the damage is to fix it later. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Some of the orchardists, we've got all these nice deer fences in place now, but um, some of those fences, it used to be that, you know, firefighter could easily drive their engine along the side of the orchard and now it's like you know you need a four-wheeler or utv to get in there because it's such a small pocket to get through now so i mean that's that's a, another challenge to deal with now that they used to not have as many of those fences so again uh, areas that you have the cows often that is enough to stop stop the fire uh one interesting uh kind of anecdotal story to talk about real quick here is that you know a lot of producers it's mainly dryland wheat that we're growing but folks are trying to get back more into some of these alternative crops such as canola which is basically it's a it's a um it's a rapeseed plant so it's in the turnip family and basically you know, canola oil is produced from the the seed pods that are on it so those pods are extremely high in oil content i believe it's like 40 percent oil content by weight so very high and so when the substation fire happened in 2018, it hit a field that had unharvested canola. So the canola was standing upright in it, like this top picture here. And basically the fire hit that and went out real quick because there wasn't much of a ladder fuel that, to carry it up in the crowns of those plants. And you had a lot of um, bare ground basically at the bottom of it. However, that same day that that fire happened, I talked with another producer who farms up above Lyle, who also grows canola. And he was doing a process that they call pushing, which is in this bottom picture here, that basically it's like you put a, a plow, soft plow on the front of your tractor, and you go out and you push the canola down. And so you kind of help mat it down, and you also help break it, break the stems off the base of the ground. So it kind of helps those pods ripen quicker, because basically essentially the plant has been, uh, been disconnected from the root, so it senesces faster. And so this gentleman, he had a fire that went into canola that he had pushed, and instead of the fire going out, he had extremely aggressive fire behavior and you're just super black smoke, really hot um, flame lengths coming off of it. And so it's just important that people think about, yeah, you know, all these agricultural crops, they are crops that, you know, often they burn similarly, but it is important to think what sort of state that fire, what sort of state that fuel is in and can really change the fire behavior. So just be cognizant of that. And so this is kind of what I was really trying to get at with having some of these other professionals on the call here was with folks that engage with putting out and suppressing wildfires that occur on their property is try to come up with a plan ahead of time that you can come up with employees that you for sure want out there putting up the fire with you, but also know other employees that because of health, age, or experience, maybe you don't necessarily want to be out there on the front lines. And so have those people available to engage with the first responders when they show up on scene and other in central roles such as sometimes you just need somebody driving 10 miles back to your pump to actually get watered or bring it back out to where the fire is at and so this here is an example of a firefighting action plan and this is in the emergency action plan or eap that i share with folks on the call as well here and so a lot of different stuff going on here but it's really bullet point uh, for employee tracking communication, going down to C, D, E, and F, that I'm trying to have people think about other roles that employees can have that would be just as beneficial as being on the front lines of the fire. Um, and so with that, yeah, I kind of want to invite uh, agency folks, do you have any feedback in terms of how best uh, landowners can tie in with you guys in terms of having people available in terms of fire access. Well, yeah, mostly, uh, <clears throat> like you mentioned there, communication is key. 
Um, you know, it doesn't have to be with, you know, one of us with every single person out there, but if there's somebody who can get a hold of um, the people who are out there, groups of folks, uh, to just let us know where they're at, what's going on, and um, kind of helping to coordinate the effort a little bit better so we're not duplicating efforts or uh, doing things in areas where uh, might put some of our folks or um, somebody else's folks in danger. You know, we don't want to be light and fire in, in an area where other folks may be. Uh, so if we don't know uh, what's going on, there we can't do a lot to get engaged until we kind of get a good assessment of what's going on so we don't hurt anybody. Um, so those are kind of our primary deals is uh, safety and communication and getting coordinated. Yeah, another question I had was just when people call in a, an incident to dispatch, I mean, are they giving you guys enough information to actually know where the fire is at and kind of give you a good uh, size up or is there still kind of a lot of unknowns that you don't know until you get on scene? Uh, really depends on the call. Um, you know, dispatch does pretty well trying to pull out some good information, um, but really something that's uh, more universally known, you know, we, uh, some of the rural areas, we get a lot of reports of fires with, you know, landowner names or, you know, old, old farmhouse and stuff like that. You know, something that if somebody didn't grow up in the area, they don't know that information. So addresses or, um, you know, coordinates or anything that's more universally known is, is more helpful than uh, kind of just general information. Yeah, so Scott, I kind of echo what Kyle's saying is that it just really depends, um, you know, who, who the reporting party is, um, whether it's more of a local that kind of knows uh, the area, so they've given us information, or if it's passerby, then we'll typically get, there's just, there's smoke, or I saw flames, or, you know, over here, over there. Um, you know, we've had people report fires in that were 100 miles away, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that part of my impression too, with just a lot of the producers out here, that it's very easy when the fire first happens that you get very concerned that um, actually flagging in access points for other people to show up to the fire sometimes is not necessarily you know high priority on their on their mind or on their list. Um, so definitely something to try to encourage people to think about. I think uh, going into the future because um, it does play pay dividends when they make it clearer how to get to the fire quickest for you folks that, you know, the sooner you get additional resources on scene, sometimes that can really make a difference too. So. Another thing I've been sharing with uh, producers as well, is just thinking about uh, power line safety, that there were definitely some people in the substation fire that didn't quite think about what they were under till till they had an arc that got pretty close to them. So this is just, video footage somewhere else of just a power line arcing there that um, professional wildland firefighters are pretty well trained in knowing to stay away from those BPA transmission lines. But sometimes it's easy if you're just um, just focusing on what's on the ground, you forget about that pretty quickly and that can be pretty hazardous. Um, and likewise, when you're uh, flying retardant on, most of the pilots do this the right way, but it's still dangerous that you can have arcing from uh, retardant or water drops as well. So it's important to keep clear of that. Um, I don't know if any agency folks, if you guys have anything to add in terms of aviation safety, um, are most people pretty good about getting out of the way or is there some coordination that's required with that sometimes? And that's it's always a good reminder, uh, especially when there's helicopters doing water drops, they can hurt, especially if they're a, a hovering drop and you're underneath. Um, there's been several injuries in the past from people that don't understand how heavy a load can be from a helicopter drop. Yeah. Yeah, again, it ties back into that communication and coordination you know, with those aerial resources up there, both for for us and them, if, if we don't know, or if, if the pilot doesn't know what's in that area, or if they see something um, in the way, uh, they won't be able to conduct their drops or anything until those folks are clear. So if we have no way to get them out of there, uh, could 
hinder efforts um, or injure somebody if, if they are in there, not quite as visible as they thought. Um, definitely uh, a lot can happen, not only from the drop itself, but stuff falling and coming down after it does hit the ground or in the trees. So. Yeah. Yeah, and so kind of moving this, getting close to wrapping this up here, but uh, basically trying to also share with people how, you know, how we can best make sure that we have a shared decision space basically between uh, producers who, who land, who have property that's engulfed in flame, and then also sharing that with the federal agencies that are there to assist and the professionals that show up to try to help, help with the fire as well. So this was a study that basically they looked at, you know, how best can we better get everybody on the same page basically so that we can more efficiently and safely uh, deal with wildfires on the landscape. And so definitely having a producer that's a liaison that can help just give some real, you know, not huge decisions that they're not telling the IC what exactly they have to do, but at least sharing the decision space that, oh, well, I wouldn't let the fire burn this next draw because there's a bunch of fuel in that draw or, don't let the fire get to the top of that ridge because there's a gusty east wind that always comes up in the late afternoon that's going to cause some increased fire behavior there. Um, and so basically just these three points of leverage that they found here, you know, sharing the decision space, having to re reduce uh, interdependence that how can we actually make multi-jurisdictional folks come to the table and work together and sometimes that's tricky because sometimes you don't need all those jurisdictions at the table until suddenly the fire has really exploded and is running up several draws that you didn't anticipate. And now you do have multiple jurisdictions that, that need to come together in a real quick, quick manner. Um, and then part of it is too, just objectives. I think now um, most producers and professionals are on the same page that, you know, ultimately it's human, human safety that that's the utmost concern. Uh, but then we have several other obje objectives of, you know, we want to stop that fire before it necessarily burns through the whole field. So if we could do a, a direct attack, sometimes that's better for the producer, but often with weather and fire uh, behavior, that's not necessarily a safe thing to do that you're going to jeopardize uh, human health to do that. So just trying to align those objectives together. Um, and just kind of wanted to conclude too here, uh, last note, just kind of with communications again, talking to the agency folks, I mean, what, what is the best way for communication with, in terms of radios? It seems like basically having that liaison that's available to be in your pickup with you is probably the best option. Yeah, if uh, folks don't have access to radios, which isn't necessary, it's just uh, um, whatever way we can figure out whether we need to keep somebody in our hip pocket, um, and then they're communicating via phone or you know two-way radio or other stuff maybe that they don't have our actual frequencies um, for our channels but um, as long as they can communicate effectively amongst each other and we have some sort of contact into that structure um, you know any anything we can make work uh, we can do so uh, just finding that person to tie in with and get that set up so uh, we can know what's going on yeah And the majority of the, the producers out there, I mean, are they using CB radios or kind of simple two-way radios? Just kind of curious what your guys' experience has been with what, what people have been using. Um, I think it's kind of a, a mix all across, um, you know, kind of just depends on the, the situation and how many folks are out there. Um, you know, on normal incidents, you know, get sort of the similar group of folks showing up. Um, but in some of those larger ones like substation, there was people that out there that nobody knew who they were, where they come from. So it um, just kind of depends on the situation, I guess, but uh, I'm not, don't have too many specifics on that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I let uh, Don to shot in here a little bit late. Hope you weren't waiting out there too long in the meeting room. Um, but getting close to wrapping up the conversation here and uh, just do you have any other um, suggestions that um, landowners can do a better job of engaging with 
with uh, agency personnel when you guys show up on scene to help with a wildfire? I think you covered it. Um, you know, as long as there's some somebody there, you know, the the worst thing that I could think of is showing up to something like this with a bunch of my folks and there's nobody to tie into because they're all out on four wheelers or tractors or something. Right. Um, which of course they want to be doing to try to do the best they can to, to stop the fire. But you know, without that communication link, we're pretty useless and we would just be sitting there uh, without any kind of uh, way to tie in and, and, and attack without that somebody, like you said, ha have somebody that, um, is going to be dedicated to that position of sitting at the gate or the house or whatever and, and, and being that liaison. Yeah, and not as many producers on this call, but just, you know, I'm sure with the current situation, obviously we don't necessarily want extra fires happening on the landscape because it's definitely going to cause a lot of uh, uh, increase intermingling amongst uh, professional firefighters when they have to get out there on a scene. So this is definitely a good early fire season, at least for folks to really be thinking about trying to, to not let the fires happen on the landscape. Um, I don't know if any of the agency folks, if you guys have anything to, to say about that, um, just I'm sure that might, your response time might be increased slightly with some of the stuff that's going on, I would assume. Uh, you know, it'll be, kind of a, a hit and miss, um, might see some extra vehicles around just so folks are a little more separated. And, um, you know, again, the social distancing thing, that's kind of something we're trying to keep an eye on. But again, our job is, you know, putting out fires. So um, in the end, we'll still do business fairly similar. It's just something we've ha we have to keep in mind and be cognizant of. And, you know, we'll try and do things a little bit differently, but, um, you know, it's uh, it'll be different, but, um, nothing too crazy you know we'll still be out there fighting fire and yeah um, making sure we take care of the landowners all right well it is oh did we're gonna say something scott oh i was just gonna say uh, one of the things we're we're i guess in a sense struggling with is you know the social distancing part of it and the briefings we've had a lot of aars uh, for the fires this season already not locally but just kind of on a national regional scale and that's usually been the biggest issue is is the distancing and then being able to communicate well uh, because of that distancing and you know trying to get it so you, you know we're going to have to take time to move away from running vehicles and things like that so we can spread out but still get the communication across sitting over the hood of a, a vehicle looking at a map may not be the way we're going to operate you know maybe yeah. we may have to but then we're going to have to take some other precautions or some other steps to, to make that happen. So it's not going to be quick. It'll be measured. It'll happen, but it's, it's, there's just some other steps we're going to take getting there. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Scott. Um, so it is six o'clock and I greatly appreciate everyone calling in. I especially appreciate um, all of you calling in with uh, Bart, Scott and Kiel and uh, Kyle, excuse me. And, uh, Don, I greatly appreciate your guys' time this evening calling in here and uh, hopefully kind of spread some of the tips you guys have to, to the other producers that are out there that weren't able to call in tonight and uh, hopefully have a, uh, have, a, have a safe and quiet fire season. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to ask them now. Uh, but otherwise, I think we're wrapping this up now.